hearing some good things about you. I can hear you through the ceiling. You want us to go to your house just to check on him. Everybody has a story of how 2020 unfolded for them, the year of the pandemic. How was your year? Well, it's an interesting um, subject because uh, the first couple of months uh, when it was really hitting smash, it was very difficult to adjust to because I have an innumerable friends and we go to lunch a lot and talk and carry on. My wife and I were literally prisoners in our home for, for a year. I haven't done a show for over a year. We are both of advanced ages um, and, and with underlying uh, health issues. We were extremely careful during, especially during the, the, the worst part of it. So we were just home day in and day out, week in and week out. Thank goodness we get along really well. I, I didn't do too, too badly. I didn't go through a lot of stuff that a lot of people went through. I mean, a lot of People went through some bad stuff. Uh, I've heard from my friends. Uh, you see it on the news. But uh, the reason that I did, I, I think, a little better than most is not only am I an actor, but I write. I, I write. I make little film shorts. Well, the time I, I utilize because I'm not one to, to watch television and, uh, you know, a couch potato. But, uh, you know, carrying on my life. Uh, as well at the same time. Being locked in, I had nowhere to go. So the time I spent 100% of my time very productively and, of course, creatively writing uh, three screenplays and my latest book, I'm so excited about it. I finished my book and I worked at that. And I actually, I really, I started reading and trying to let the television alone. It turned out it's kind of marvelous. And it worked out Fine. I mean, I really enjoy it. I read a lot of uh, the Russian novels, which I hadn't read for years. And I even read Jane Eyre, which I had never read, which is actually a very good book. About uh, two or three months before COVID was even born in our vocabulary, I was writing. I, I was writing and I needed more time. Uh, I was doing a lot of favors for friends, being in their film shorts, but I didn't have time to write. So I was really complaining to myself. And then COVID hit and everybody stopped going out and uh, couldn't go into restaurants and all that crap started to happen. And I was trapped in my house I, I, at, at the moment. So I sat down and I started to write and I wrote two screenplays in the time that I was sequestered. All the time that I was writing, I didn't have to wear a mask. And uh, I would just go out for supplies, you know, food, <laughs> medical attention, whatever was needed at the moment. What I'm going to remember most about uh, the 2020 and the quarantine is that as an entertainer and a very busy person, it has taught me the joy of of uh, being home. Uh, I've always enjoyed being home uh, with my family and, uh, and my loved ones, but it was always kind of when I had time to be home uh, with my family and loved ones. Uh, in this line of work, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty demanding uh, lifestyle. And when opportunity knocks, you have to, you have to go to work. Uh, this time around, because there was no work, uh, uh, I was home for a full year. I went nuts in the beginning of it. I just wasn't used to being home all the time. I'm also an outdoorsman and I miss doing all of that. As time went along, uh, 
it's reached the point uh, where uh, I'm really enjoying being home. And in fact, it's so much so I don't know if I'll ever really go back to full time performing again or not. Uh, even though the bookings have now begun to come in, I, I think I'm going to limit it. Uh, and I'm going to stay home from now on. I feel very fortunate because, uh, you know, I I have a roof over my head and I have food on the table and I don't have to worry about it. And so I right. every morning I would wake up and say, you know, I'm very, very grateful uh, because my heart goes out to those who aren't as fortunate as, as I am. And yet, sure, yeah, you know, you get a little tired of being housebound but um hey considering uh, the alternative i'm i'm grateful and we're we're getting through this i was living with my family in houston texas so it's not in on the island in maine but there was something that came up and vanessa my niece she arranged for me to paint on the back patio and i did a painting of a garden scene from the potted plants in the patio of the Eric Carle Museum. It's fair to say, I think, that most writers are introverts, and uh, we like to be alone. And in fact, we can't do what we do unless we do it in a solitary place. The year of the pandemic was not a hardship for me. It gave me the solitude to do what I do anyway but I didn't have to interrupt myself again and again. I actually had to cancel a seven city book tour. I had a new book published in April of, I've lost all track of time, 2020, and I had to cancel it uh, because everything had been locked down. And although the publishers don't like to cancel such an event because it sells books, and we writers like to sell books too, Nonetheless, uh, it meant that I did not have to go to airports, get on planes, miss planes, connect with planes, lose my luggage, check into hotels, forget what city I was in. I'm in touch with my family. I am also fortunate because I have my husband and we're together and we also have our pet cat, Nikki, that keeps us uh, laughing all the time. She's very funny and uh, so then I read and uh, I binge watch television, certain certain series. We've just now started to venture out a little bit to some local restaurants where I live in Santa Barbara. But we go early on a Monday night, uh, and we're like around 5.30 in the evening to have dinner because there, there's nobody else in the restaurant but us because we're nice. early birds. So it feels kind of good to get dressed and uh, to go out. And um, so I'm weathering it very well and uh, just hoping that soon this nightmare will be truly over. Uh, I did a lot of Zooming uh, in order to take the place of those events but I got to do it from this very room where I'm sitting today. So not to say that I liked the pandemic, but I will say that it served me well. I was working on a new book, required a lot of research. I could do that all right here in my home. You, you mentioned that you were, you were binging. Uh, what have you been watching? Have you seen any, anything? Well, I watched, uh, I, I watched Bridgerton <laughs> and okay. I watched, I started rewatching, um, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. My mom loves Breaking Bad. Oh, I I had seen it when it first came out, but you know you you forget certain uh, certain scenes and so forth. And Better Call Saul is just as good as Breaking Bad because oh, yeah. it's created by the same people. I'm really excited because in August I'm going to be doing a guest shot on Better Call Saul. Really? Yeah. Wow, that is exciting. I know. <laughs> it's locked, which means you're trying to break an enter. So I say again, you got a warrant? So another thing that I'm putting together through this docu-series is giving actors, artists, authors, the chance to tell their story how they want it to be heard. So how would you tell your story? 
I read that you you started in in the Navy in in 1951 doing special services entertainment. Could you tell me a little bit about what it was like during that time? It's very uh, camouflaged because what I did was run the pool hall and uh, the rec room and ping pong and showed movies. So that's what I uh, did most of the time uh, in the Orient, in Japan, and in the land base there, naval base. And in Hawaii, I was there for a while too. So, And then when I got out, uh, my sister was in a play and I went to uh, see it. It was um, a play called Dark of the Moon. It's a very theatrical, extraordinary play, uh, kind of sexy and, you know, so I got, I got really fascinated by that and went backstage, met the director and he and I became friends and finally coaxed me into being in a play, which was fine. And I liked that. Then I did um, a bunch of plays for him in Louisville. And then he got me a job at a summer stock company in Virginia, then another one in Delaware. And from there I went up to New York and when I was when I got to New York, I got uh, almost immediately a play, which was uh, sort of unheard of. Everybody said, but I was lucky, I guess. And then I joined the the New York Shakespeare Festival, which is uh, run by a guy named Joe Papp, who's passed on. But the theater is still there in Central Park, and uh, so I did about ten Shakespeare plays there over a couple of years. Then I got a play on Broadway and then did three or four plays on Broadway. So. I was also reading that after you did theater, you worked your way into film and television. Yeah. Um, did you put, do you have a preference between the television acting and the style of a movie? Oh, mov movie's much more uh, helpful and it's in, it allows time to do the thing. And if it's a good script, which a lot of Mark, but a lot of ones that were big hits that I did, you know, the Lethal Weapon was a huge hit. Uh, it's too bad I was killed in the first first one, or I would have probably been in the other ones. <laughs> That's bad luck. <laughs> Liar Liar was a big hit. Gross Point Blank was a big hit. Anyway, I was in uh, when I was at the Barter Theater years and years ago. Robert Mitchum came to see the the uh, play that I was in, which was The Rainmaker, and he he uh, offered me a little part in his movie. He was shooting Thunder Road, which was turned out to be a kind of a, a drive-in classic. There's a funny story about it. I, 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 I was 22 years old or something like that. And I, the first scene I had was with him, a two minute scene with him. And so you can imagine how nervous I was. And uh, I was waiting around and then he came out and they said, okay, let's do this scene. And he looked over at me and he walked over to me very slowly. And when he got to me, he said, I want you to remember that I'm big Mitch and you're little Mitch. <laughs> And then he said, shall we uh, shoot this scene or would you like to rehearse? I know you uh, theater people like to rehearse a lot. So I said, no, 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 let's shoot it. And that was my initiation into the movies, which was great. But I was on the road with a play called A Moon for the Misbegotten. We've been across the country and we were playing in Los Angeles and Lee Marvin and some of the uh, director and some came to see uh, the play and cast me in this big Western. How they got that from that play, I don't know. But anyway, Monty Walsh, which was a big smash hit uh, movie at the time. This was 1970, I think. So there I, where I got hooked into horses and all that stuff, you know. But anyway, it was uh, great fun. So I stayed at that point, I stayed in in Hollywood and moved here and, and started doing television, a lot of a lot of television, a lot of movies and stuff. And it was great fun. I'm the kind of actor who uh, they say, God, I know you. I know you. You were in, what's your name? <laughs> you know, it's one of those kind of things, you know. And I'm, I'm always shocked when somebody knows my name, which is kind of great. <laughs> but I did uh, 
65, 70 movies or something like that, unbelievable, you know, so, and uh, hundreds of television shows. So my face was all over the place for a long time. And... You know, everybody's story begins way, way back. I was very fortunate to be born into a family that valued books. My mother had been a teacher before she married. She was had been a kindergarten teacher. She never worked after she was married, but she was a wonderful mother to small children. And she read to us all the time. And I had a sister three years older who began school when she was six and I was three. And my sister came home every day and taught me everything she had learned, uh, mostly about how to read. And because I was so familiar with the books of my childhood, and my sister explained how the letters had sounds and they went together to make the words. Then I could pick up a book I was familiar with and almost immediately could make that connection and could read. And it just opened up the world to me. And I entered the world of books that I've been part of ever since. By the time I was eight, perhaps, I knew that I wanted to be a writer. And I you know, I, I followed the regular educational path, but when I went to college, I did so with a, spe a special scholarship to study writing. I went to Brown University. But <laughs> if I were telling this as a story, as a, as a novel, as a piece of fiction, it would follow this trajectory. And so she began uh, to study writing, but she was interrupted because stories always take these diversions Someone has a goal, but they run into obstacles, and they have to solve them. Uh, this, this, I guess, <clears throat> would be an obstacle, but it didn't require solving. Uh, the impediment to my career at that point was my own, I guess stupidity would not be too strong a word, but it was partly the times. This was not unusual. I dropped out of college just after my 19th birthday to get married. Uh, women did that then. Uh, my boyfriend, and he was just a boy too, I had just turned 19, he was 21, had just graduated from college. He was being commissioned in the Navy and he wanted to get married. And of course, then so did I. So I dropped out of college and then I had a baby when I was 20. I had a baby when I was 21 had a baby when I was 23, I had a baby when I was 24, and suddenly I still wanted to be a writer, but I was 25 years old and I had four children under the age of five. So it took me a long time. When my youngest child, Ben, I had two boys, two girls, uh, Ben began kindergarten at age five and I went back to college. It took me four years to complete my bachelor's degree. I went on for a master's. And then finally, uh, I began to write professionally. My first book was published when I was 40 years old. So it had taken me a long time to get to the place where I'd always wanted to be. Uh, but maybe all of that was part of the experience that I needed in order to write. Maybe if I had graduated from college at age 21, uh, I wouldn't have been ready to be a writer. In fact, I remember a professor in college telling me that I could be a writer, that I had whatever gifts were necessary and education had enhanced, that I could be a writer. He said, but you haven't experienced much yet. Uh, you need to experience grief, he said. And I remember trudging away from his office, thinking, what does he know an old guy like that? He was probably 45. And, uh, and yet, I then went on to live the kind of life that gave me those experiences, including grief, because we all do suffer that if we live long enough. Uh, and then I began to write. I have now... 46 years later, uh, written, I think, the book that will be published next year will be probably my 50th. And uh, so I have been busy all those years, working hard at it. 
uh, loving every minute of it. And uh, that's my story. Timing is everything. And uh, for me, the timing has worked. I'm also very fortunate that I am now 84 years old, but my brain is still intact. And not everybody 84 years old can say that, I suppose, because I can still put together uh, the words to, to create a book, as I've spent the past year doing. How I got to where I'm sitting here talking to you now? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, no, I, I, that's cool. I I, stand, I started up n n nowhere. I I, st I came from Far Rockaway. I went to Far Rockaway High School. I went to Syracuse. Graduated as an industrial design, but I didn't want to be one. I just did that because my parents wanted me to go to college, and I was trying to be a good son. But as soon as I graduated, the good son went right out the window. I, I didn't have a good upbringing, so I mean that that that's why. I kind of ran away <laughs> at, at age of 18. I kind of cut my parents off and my parents cut me off. I was disinherited. So, so there was a, and, I, and that was cool. That was great because it made it official. I, I was bereft of any kind of support. So I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to do anything. And so uh, Carl Gottlieb, who wrote Jaws, was my best friend in, in Syracuse University. I was about to go to uh, Detroit to design uh, cars. I think it was Ford or Chevrolet. I don't remember. Uh, Carl said that he in, at Syracuse said uh, he's going to Greenwich Village and starve and become a writer. So I said, oh, that sounds like more fun than going to Detroit and becoming a designer. And I chose to go to S Greenwich Village and starve instead. I never looked back or thought, wow, why did I do that? No, that was great. So I starved for a while, and then I was going to uh, open mic nights. Finally got a job mopping up uh, duck boards behind a bar from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. I was locked in. That night I would go to the coffee houses. I thought, well, you know, I'm a funny guy. I can, I can do that. No, 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 you can't, Larry. <laughs> it's not that easy. But for some reason, I just kept on saying, oh, I could do it better next time. I just discovered that there's a lot of uh, open mic nights. There was open mic nights on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Sunday, Monday. If I would say something funny, I could remember what was funny. I would get up and I would say the setup to the funny line. I would get the laugh, try something new, but I would collect them. So after about five open mic nights, I'd have like a solid five minutes. And then I would collect them and he finally would have 20 minutes. And that was like a set. Woody Allen's manager showed up and said, hey, you got a manager? And I go, no. And he says, you want one? And I go, yeah. And he says, how about me? And I said, yeah. I mean, I didn't know who he was. And then he started booking me in nightclubs, this, this Woody Allen's manager. So in, 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 in Greenwich Village in those days, you weren't trying to be famous. You were trying to get representation. So if you had representation, you were king of Greenwich, Greenwich Village. Hey, I got, a, I got a manager, man. Whoa, and everybody would, you know, gather around you. How did you do that? Where were you playing? You know, what was your shtick? What? <laughs> I just want to know. You would go to where he was found and you would, it was weird. So that's how I got into show business. It's just, I had nothing to do during at night. And I opened Mike Knight's manager. I was opening for Woody Allen for a long time. And then um, I got into um, what you call critical thinking comedy, a $35 round trip plane fare from Hollywood. That's what it costs to fly up to San Francisco and back, 35 bucks. So we were being shakabuku, kidnapped from, from our stage into sitcoms. They would fly up, see somebody, tell the producer, call this guy, not me, because I was too quirky. I was too tall, thin, and quirky at the time. But all my you know, fellow improvisers are flying down for, for a day or for a week to rehearse and come back, but they would always come back. And then after about a year of this, they wouldn't come back. 
<laughs> they were just, hey, he called. He's not coming back. <laughs> but finally, I got a call from uh, Laverne and Shirley. They called me at home. I don't know how they got my phone number. Laverne, her brother was the producer of, of Laverne and Shirley. So the production ever called me and said, Penny Marshall came up to see your show last week. She said, get the tall guy. Uh, there's this dance scene in Laverne and Shirley, uh, and she wants to dance with him because I was a physical comedian. So I did the show, and, and everybody liked me, and, and Laverne uh, Penny liked me. I did, did a good job. I went back, and I was there for another week up in San Francisco, and I got a call from an agent saying, uh, I hear you were on the Laverne and Shirley show. I saw it, it was really cool. I went there and I spoke to them and they said, you didn't have an agent. Uh, would you like one? It's like this, yeah, I, had this, I heard this from Woody Allen's manager about a couple of years ago. <laughs> I, said, I, said, I said, yeah, he said, well, why don't you come in and talk? Are you gonna be down here at any time? And I said, well, I'll take off a couple of days. I had 35 bucks round trick, you know and I'll sleep at a friend's house. Okay, so I, because all my friends were down there by now, everybody has started with, I mean, they had mansions by now. So he signed me, so then I just couch surfed, and until here I am talking to you. <laughs> it's very, very simple. Well, my story is so unique, it's so different. I started out as a professional ball player, and I was a bonus ball player. But unfortunately, in my second year, I had an uh, arm problem. I was a sore arm, and they didn't know too much about kinesiology in those days. Today, would have, I would have been out maybe a week or 10 days and been back in action. But it was prolonged, and then I had to have an operation, and then decided that, thanks to my doctor's advice, I was thinking about going to uh, the University of Miami of Florida to study uh, drama, my second love which is uh, an acting career. So he said, that's exactly where I want you to go. I want you to go to some place where it's warm during the winter uh, months, which it was at the time. And uh, after the surgery, uh, I attended the University of Miami of Florida as a drama major. And during the interim, my, my roommate, the great uh, Mickey McDermott, left-handed pitcher with uh, Red Sox, Yankees, and Washington Senators, and the St. Louis Cardinals, introduced me to uh, Tommy Dorsey. We had dinner, Tommy was doing one-nighters up and down the uh, east and west coast of Florida and invited us to dinner. So I said, you know what, gee, I, I can't make it uh, for dinner, I'll meet you for coffee because I'm doing a, rehearsing a play um, at uh, the Ring Theater at the university. He said, well, that's great, fine. Leave, leave us a pass, we'll have a late dinner and we'll discuss uh, what I see and, and uh, he and his manager. Uh, came and I left them a pass. We had a late dinner and uh, he said, look, I'm only going to tell you this once. He was a great leader, wonderful band leader, but a leader of men, very intelligent. And uh, uh, he said, I'm only going to tell you this once. There's one other uh, person that I had really believed in, uh, helped a lot of people, but this other person I really believed in, he did okay. His name was Frank Sinatra. So I said, really? I said, Tom, you really? Uh, he said, you, you've got all the attributes to be uh, an actor. All you need is experience in front of the camera, but you on stage, you have great presence. You have a great voice. He said, uh, you, you, you've got it. So if your arm doesn't respond, I'm going to the big leagues. Now I'm, I'm invited by the Washington Senators to the big league club. So my boyhood dream came true. I'm, I'm now going to join the Washington Senators in March. And he said, well, here's my itinerary. We'll be in touch. And I'll arrange, I want to arrange the screen tests at MGM Studios for you. So I'm going to leave it up to you. That's your decision. If your arm doesn't come around or it's slow coming around, I'll be playing at the uh, home show at the Pan Pacific Auditorium in Hollywood for two weeks. I took a little two weeks leave of absence, joined Tommy in, in Hollywood, during that period of time. He arranged a screen test for me at MGM. I tested out at MGM. They signed me to a contract and I never went back to baseball. 30 films, 150 television shows later. The leather piece here, the shirt, the shirt over here on my right shoulder, that dress 
was a one in Winterhawk. You know, it played the title role in the uh, film Winterhawk, which is a was a tremendous uh, uh, success critically and of course financially. And I wore that shirt. That was uh, done by David Powell, a wonderful uh, set de uh, decorator, a wonderful artist. He's a fine painter. David uh, created that and presented that to me as a gift after we finished the film. And the bow behind it, the bow and arrow behind it, the long hunting bow, that, that was uh, given to me uh, by uh, uh, George Montgomery. That belonged to George Montgomery, wonderful Western actor. The hard work, the work, the thousands of hours I dedicated myself to my theater groups. I belong to the Actors Studio. I belong to Theater East, Theater West, groups in, in uh, California and Hollywood. That um, thousands of hours I worked to develop my craft so that nobody could rock my boat. I could work with any actor in the world and with my presence and with my understanding of my craft and what I could do, what I can't do. I will challenge anybody, anybody I could work with because I know my craft. I paid my dues, but that takes lots of, lots of hundreds of hours in dedication and passion for the uh, objective that I wanted to, to uh, that I worked for and wanted to achieve. We were poor, and uh, I was raised by my grandmother, and uh, we really had no, no money, really. And I remember when I graduated uh, from Hollywood High School, I wanted desperately to go to UCLA, but right. get this, way back in the covered wagon days, uh, the, the tuition was $43. Can you believe $43. it? $43. But we wow. didn't have, we didn't, that was too rich for our blood because our right. rent at the time was $30 a month. And even that, my grandmother thought, oh my God, how are we going to be able to do that? You know, so... She said, there's just no way you're going to get to go to UCLA. Forget it. Well, we lived in a one-room apartment in an apartment building. Across the lobby was the pigeonhole mailboxes. So every morning, it was kind of my little job. To, I opened the door, and I would peek out to see if there might be an envelope in our particular slot. And so this one morning, there was. And I put on my robe, and I went across the lobby, and I picked the envelope out of our, the slot, and it had my name typed on it, and I um, opened it up, and there was a $50 bill. Ooh. Well, yeah, and to this day, I don't know where that came from. Really? My grandmother didn't have it, and the people, we, I mean, it was just like out of the blue, which was my ticket to UCLA. Wow. So I got to go to UCLA, and I was going to major in journalism, but they didn't have a major in journalism. You could take a course and join the school paper. So I looked through the catalog, and there was a, a major called Theater Arts English, which then would give me the playwriting courses, because I wanted to be a writer. And I thought I'd do right. that and join the Daily Bruin, the newspaper. But I didn't realize, no matter what, if you were a freshman in that major, you had to take a course in acting, a course in scenery building, a course in costumes, and a course in lighting. And so wow. there I was, you know, and I was thrown into this acting class. There were 14 of us. I was terrified. I'd never done anything like that, you know. And yeah. um, I had to do a scene and pick a scene to do in front of the class. So I picked something kind of light and uh, they laughed. And it was where they should laugh. You know? right. And I thought, wow, that's a good feeling. And so I started trying out for some of the school, uh, student written uh, school plays and I was getting parts and doing, and all of a sudden I'm 18 years old and I never knew that I had that kind of, I don't know what you want to call it, talent, or that kind of interest yeah. in being a performer. 
it was all an accident. And had I not, I mean, had there been a school of journalism, I wouldn't be talking to you today like this. That's incredible. You never know. And then some, uh, one of the students came up and asked me uh, if I could carry a tune. And I said, yeah, because my grandmother and my mother and I used to sit in the kitchen and sing a little bit. So I yeah. got into a chorus of a, a, a musical in the music department. And uh, I was loud. I was in the chorus, but I was loud. <laughs> so the yeah. director said, you're a little bit too loud for the chorus, but would you do a scene from Guys and Dolls, which was a big hit musical many years ago in okay. on Broadway, and and sing a solo, do a solo. And I, I was like, oh, I don't know. You know, and in it, Miss Adelaide, that, that would be the character I would be doing is singing about the fact that she has a bad cold. And so I thought, well, I can do that because if I hit a wrong note or anything, I can pretend that it's, it's due to the cold and, you know, and, all. and I did right. that. And all of a sudden I said, I want to be, go to Broadway and be on the stage in musical comedy. So all of it, Devin was just boom, you know, I just stand right here, there's a nice draft. I'll be dry in no time. You swam the moat. Uh-huh. We tried to stop her, but she wouldn't wait for the drawbridge. I was, I was doing stuff in the musical comedy department at UCLA. We were going to do our finals, and I chose a scene from another musical comedy called Annie Get Your Gun. And uh, the professor said to the class, we're going to uh, have have a party and in San Diego, a formal party, ladies in gowns and the men in tuxedos. And why don't you kids come down? There were nine of us. And do your scenes as entertainment for the party, and I'll grade you, you know, for that. So, wow, wow. we all went down, and we did our scenes. And I remember I went to the hors d'oeuvre table, <laughs> and I'm putting hors d'oeuvres in a napkin to take home to my grandmother. And there's a oh. tap on my shoulder. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm busted, you know, <laughs> for stealing orders. And I turned around, and it was a, a man, gentleman and his wife, you know, tuxedo, and she was in a lovely gown. And he, they said, we love what you did. And he said, what What do you want to do with your life? And I said, well, someday I want to go to, you, to, go to uh, Broadway and be in, music, in a musical comedy. And he said, well, why aren't you there now? Why aren't you in, why aren't you in New York now? And I said, well, you know, I, I I can't afford it yet, and I'm hoping someday I can save up enough money. He said, I'll lend you the money. And I thought, wow. well, the champagne's talking, you know. And uh, his wife said, no, he means it. So he gave me his card, and he said, be in my office a week from tomorrow, and we'll talk about your career. So I was able to get back down there. And I went into his office, and he's sitting behind this huge desk. And he said, okay, I'm going to lend you $1,000. Well, I told you, our rent was $30 a month. And I went, oh, wow. And he said, there are stipulations. He said, you must use this to go to New York. If you can, you pay it back in five years, no interest. You must promise to help others out if you are successful. And you must never reveal my name. So that's how wow. I got to go to New York. Trip of a lifetime. It was. I'd never been any further east than Texas, where I was born. I met a place called a rehearsal club. And it was on West 54th Street. And I went over there. The rehearsal club was very famous at the time. It uh, There were 25 women that lived in it. And they were all wanted to be in the theater, the rent was only $18 a week, room and board, so that I could afford, and so I met the house mother, it's all very proper, very on the up and up, so I, there I was, I had a cot and a dresser and a little place to put my suitcase at the foot of the cot, and four other roommates, I went to an agent, finally got in to see one, and I said, he said, well, let me know when you're in something. And 
I said, I don't know how to get in something unless I have an agent. <laughs> I can't get an agent. <laughs> it's catch-22. And right. he said, well, go put on your own show. Ooh. Well, the penny dropped, and I went back to the club, and I called a meeting with all the girls. I said, we're going to put on a show. And we did. We we put on our own show, and we, re- uh, we rehearsed, we wrote it, and we uh, rented a concert hall for two nights and sent out penny postcards to every agent and director and producer in town saying, you're always saying, let us know when you're in something. Well, we're in something, so come and see us, and this postcard is your ticket. So it was packed. All these, you know, big agents and directors and everything, they came both nights, and uh, three of us got calls the next day, and I got an agent. Devin, you know, you make your own breaks. Yeah. I was very naive, but I think that worked for me because I felt there's nothing I couldn't do if I put my mind to it. When I was in the hotel, I called home, collect, and my grandmother, and then my mother got on the phone, and my kid sister, come home. I said, I just got here, <laughs> you know, and we all started crying, and I felt so, it was the first time I'd ever been alone. And that was the night I got there. And I love rain. I don't like it when it causes floods, but I love rain. And I mm-hmm. hung up, and it started raining. And I looked out the window and everything, and I turned on the radio in the hotel room. And you can look it up. It said, Hurricane Carol is on its way to New York. No. Yep. Oh, my. <laughs> what? It- <laughs> what? Okay, I'm okay. <laughs> it's going to be fine, you know. You really brought the storm. All those things, you know, the $50 bill, the gentleman who lent, lent me the $1,000, the rain, the fact I had the one telephone number that then gave me a good place where I could park myself and live, you know. It mm-hmm. was just all quite wonderful. And so I, I just felt like I've been blessed. Well, I started out as a as a, a farm kid in the Midwest in Kansas. Entertainment world was something so far from that that it seemed like it would be an impossible thing to even dream of. That was only meant for super duper talented people and special people with special personalities and such. I never dreamed I'd ever be an entertainer. But I, I've always loved the out of doors and I've always loved Arizona even as a kid. I came out here to Arizona in 1959 with 50 bucks in my pocket, went to work at a television station. Uh, That's what I'd been uh, educated in at Kansas University. After I got into television, I had the opportunity to uh, sing and play and get paid to do it. So I did, and uh, I found that I could be very successful doing it. And uh, so TV went by the wayside and entertainment came in. I traveled all over the United States, mostly the Western states in the uh, 1960s and during the folk music era, worked clubs and coffee houses all over the place. Got to know everybody in the, in the business. And then a fellow by the name of Randy Sparks was forming a group called the New Christy Minstrels. And he called me up and asked if I'd like to throw my hat in the ring. I said, yeah, it sounds like a a lot of fun. So I did, and uh, I had a feeling that we were going to do well, but I didn't know we'd do that well (laughs) and and that quickly. Uh, I think our first few months out, we must have sold at least 400,000 albums that first, uh, first time out of the gate. I had to keep pinching myself because there I was working all the world class clubs from Carnegie Hall and Double Page Life magazine, all that stuff. And uh, it was great. Really, really was great. And I loved it. And I I was thrilled to death and I'm grateful for it. But right at the top of our career, show business per se, and I don't really get along that well. I, I'm just a little too country, I think, for uh, Hollywood. I was at, missing Arizona. I was already writing and photographing Arizona before I left here to, for the Christie's. Came back 
and started to do that. And of course, I had great visibility because uh, I was famous. So the governor uh, of our uh, in 1966 sent a House of Representatives and he said, how would you like to be Arizona's official balladeer? I went, I'm not quite sure what that is, but sure sounds good. <laughs> and uh, I said to myself, that's exactly what I want to be. So I said, yeah. And since that time, uh, 13 governors have come, come along and each have reappointed me as such. I thought maybe you'd like to see one because I'm the first state Arizona was the first state in the union to have an official balladeer, and I'm the first one they've ever had. Since that, uh, since that time, other states have come along, and they now have balladeers. But I was the first one. This is identical to a House of Representatives when he's uh, sworn into office. The first five or six years, everybody thought it was a joke. Oh, you're going to be the official bolo tire wearer next next year, you know. And, uh, but then people found out that uh, I was, I was dead serious about it. And it's what I intended to hang my talents on from here on out. So now I've been 55 years as of February and uh, 13 governors. It's been, been a wonderful, wonderful ride. Uh, I hope I can do it for uh, many more years to come. I'm still writing, still photographing. And uh, here I am. The thing I've been involved with most over the past, uh, Hmm. Eight or nine years, I guess, is our wild horses. Our wild horses of the West are in great, great danger. They're getting round up, rounded up and sent to slaughterhouses. We now have more wild horses in pens stored and stashed around the United States than we have running on the, on the public lands anymore because they're rounding them up with helicopters and trucking them off. And, and they are part of our heritage. You know, the West, we didn't have any horses here until Coronado came up here, or uh, it was De Anza, actually, and brought horses with him. And the horse has, uh, has played an important role in the opening of the West and the uh, development of, uh, of this nation. They deserve uh, to be respected. These horses have been running here a long, long time, and they're a beautiful thing. There's this organization called the Salt River Wild Horse Management Group, and Marilee and I uh, joined that several years ago, and I've been raising money for that group during my shows for the past, I don't know, seven or eight years, something like that, I guess. We've, we've raised quite a bit of money for them. They were scheduled to be rounded up, and we were able to get that stopped through a lawsuit and such, but uh, they're out there on this very afternoon. The last little bit is your advice uh, or a message that you give to the youth. Each one of us is, is born with something. God has gifted us something within. Young people have to, along with good teachers, recognize what that talent, what a, that ability is, whether it's intellect, whether it's the arts, whatever it is, to develop that and fall in love with that interest like a piece of art. If it's a piece of art, you're going to give it your, your best with all your, your heart and soul to, to realize these along the way, these moments, and not let them go awry and get lost somewhere and not take advantage of all the opportunities we have in our educational system. The greatest contribution you and I and, and students can make is individuality to a democratic society. Each generation has to, has to create and invent. What has happened to our country and in the world, groups are formed. They've stifled individuality in thinking, and people aren't talking with one another more. Speak with one, with one another. You know, if share human emotions. Share thoughts while looking at someone, you know, in their eyes and, and, um, and exchange their, their feelings about whatever the subject matter is. They should treat whatever, whatever their interests are like a piece of art and go for it. And just put your best foot forward and try to be the best you can. In all of this early part of my life, I, I became very strung out on alcohol 
and it was uh, ruining my life. It, it could have ruined my life. And because uh, I've seen it ruin a lot of people's lives. And what happens is, what happened was the theater was such a powerful thing that if you're hooked into the theater, it'll carry you and you work, you have to work and work very hard at your credit to learn the skill of acting. And then you can do any part you want, but you have to have the skill. You have to learn the skill. And that's what I did. And that's what saved me. And um, it's uh, uh, an enormous gift to have something that you can really, really bring your whole life, your body, your emotional equipment, and your brains to. And because there's so much nonsense going on all around that you've got to focus on something that's really powerful. I like that. And I would say it's akin to religion and uh, because it has that kind of compulsion. If you really want it, if you really dig in and want it and, and nobody can deny you, you, you cannot be denied. I mean, you may get rejected for part this part or that part, but if you stick with it, you will get somewhere, you will make it and you will be able to make a living and you will love it as I did. And as I learned to do, there is a uh, inner world that you can get connected with. You know, it's not all bullshit out front. It's an inner thing that, that where the real deep, powerful acting comes from is an inner movement. And uh, if you find that, you will never let it go. It's just extraordinary. I, last year, or the year before the pandemic closed us all down, I was asked to speak at a high school graduation. Of course, that's the time in which you're supposed to impart wisdom. And uh, I realized I didn't have very much. When I stood in front of that high school graduation class, uh, I was I was feeling as if I was 17 years old. I did tell them that if I could give people only three bits of advice when they were young, I would, let me see if I can remember the third, I would tell them to read, to travel, and to vote. Whether they want to be writers or artists or whatever, uh, to take an interest in their government because those kids, and you're one of them, you guys are going to determine the future. And boy, it's never more important than it is right now. The luckiest people in the world are the ones who love what they do for work. And so many people don't. So many people go off every day to a job that they hate. Because I love what I do, I do it all the time. I, I do it uh, many hours every day because I can't think of anything I'd rather be doing. I often stop working at the end of a day. I try to stop at a place where I know what's going to happen next and where I'm excited about what, I'm, what paragraph I'm working on because then it's easy to go back to. I do advise young writers who they always worry about writer's block and getting stuck and of course that does happen but uh if it's it's a mistake to stop when you're stuck because then you don't want to go back to it i remember you know some people i i get mailed saying how how do you deal with um with with not getting the job you know mm -hmm. and how do you deal with depression you know if you, especially if you want to be in get a sh get in a show and you audition and you don't get it and you get depressed you know and i remember when i was in new york i did uh, i did an audition for something in the chorus and i can't remember which show it was and it 
was it narrowed down to another girl and me. And I thought I had it. I thought, well, I, I, I've got this job. I just know it. Well, I didn't. She got it. And for some reason, Devin, and I'm grateful to this day, it occurred to me, wait a minute, it's her turn. It's not right. my turn. My turn will come someday, but this was the time for her. And that kept me from being depressed. Right. You know, that, that you, you might not be the right type or anything, but if you, mm -hmm. if you have the fire in your belly and you really want to do it, stick to it and your turn will come. Uh, it's easy in life to get sucked into uh, falling into line, getting a job and that's it, you know, and there you are at the bank for the rest of your life, you know. Uh, I have, on our pre uh, setup, I, I was saying I've lived the life of three men. I really have. I, I have packed I, I, uh, so much into my lifetime uh, because I chose to do it and I've, I've really used my life. And I guess if I would like to say something, if there are any, if there are young people watching, is that youth is, is a very valuable thing. It, that's the time to get your job done. That's the time to get your work done. When you get older, the, that, that fire and that energy, you just can't follow through. It's like getting tired. You know, you get tired after a while. And, uh, but when you're young, man, you can go day and night and, and accomplish your dreams. And that's what I did. I really grabbed the bull by the horns and, and I reached out to accomplish my dreams. I didn't wait for anybody to ask me. If you've got a passion in life, don't let it cook in the oven too long. You know, I've had too many friends that sit at home and rehearse all their lives. Come on, when are you going to go out? Oh, I'm not ready. I'm not ready yet. Let me tell you. Two shows on stage will do more to polish you up than six weeks of rehearsing in your living room <laughs> because uh, you just have to deliver when you're standing in front of people. And that's the way life is. Just jump in there and do it and uh, make some mistakes and correct them a little bit later. Uh, I guess that's what I'd really, really like to, the message I'd like to leave with your younger people here. What I tell myself is remember the beta state, remember the beta state. The beta state is relax, relax, relax. And my father put fear in me and it's still, you know, somewhere in there. And, and if the, the right uh, things go, it starts to fill my consciousness and I forget. Fear it, you will fear it. <laughs> it's basically <laughs> what happens. So uh, th that's what, so that's what I can't do. But acting is a, a learned thing. So what I tell myself is relax, get rid of the fear. It's a fed to you fear. It's not, it's not something you're born with. You know? The thing that I do to compound the exorcism is I uh, learn more and more music. The, the, the better I get on guitar, the more lines I can learn like that. It is a direct connection. And I know the connection has to do with music is totally unconscious or subconscious or, but it has nothing to do with consciousness. The correlation between music and memorization to me in my life is a very definite, very real one. So that's how I practice acting, by the way. What do I tell myself that I can tell other people and this is really true, man. This is deep. Figure it out. That's all you have to do. And nobody wants to. And that's why they can't. And it's e as simple as that. Because if I find, it took me years to figure it out. Because I didn't care. I was lazy. And, and it wasn't incumbent upon me, you know. But when I finally had to figure it out, Took me a while, but I think, oh, for me, it's the connection of music to memorization. I mean, other people, you've something else, but 
Nobody is stupid enough to not be able to figure it out. I don't care how stupid you think you are. You were born with enough backup, exterior or interior drives to figure it out. And uh, that's the best I can tell anybody. My life is a never ending with drawing, finding my way to connect with others through my love of art and opening up the ability of art in others as well. When you're doing something constructive and creative, never let anything or anybody stop you. The highlight is always opening up an excitement and love to do art and to respond to art. Each day, recreate life through art. Life always persists in doing good, in doing an outreach of good, of helping others alleviate any suffering around you but always persist in creative work in one kind or another. There's so much that is open to what the world means through art. And yeah. it, 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 it opens up the art of the world, not just the of your country, but it's an incredible experience to see how others have responded creatively to the day. It's always a good feeling that what you have done in the, your time can be enjoyed by people of other times as well. And so I'm very happy in that my work in writing and in drawing persists in its outreach to others in all parts of the world. Goodbye. <laughs> well, you take care and persist in your love of art. I got to talk to a, an artist and author named Ashley Bryan. I'm not sure if you've heard oh, the name. Oh, let me just interrupt you to say Ashley is a very dear friend of mine. Is he? Yes, yes. Oh, wow. I, I spoke with him a couple weeks ago. He's 97 now? 90, yeah, he's turning 98. Yeah, soon. In July is his birthday, yeah. yes. Dear, dear man, I'm looking, as we speak, at, at a piece of art that Ashley gave me. It's right over there. Wow. I'll it to you. Wait a minute. Sure, I'm sure. This. I have a better idea. I'm going to go take it off the wall and show it to you. In another room, I have a very large painting of Ashley's. This is a small woodcut. Wow. He's titled it Cookie, Cookie Jar. There That's really cool. At any rate, Ashley is a dear, dear man that I've known for probably 50 years. Yeah, but I was you were saying just the ability to still continue... Uh, your creativity and yes. he's done that as well and and at 97 uh, speaking to him was was remarkable you know uh, and I, you probably didn't have the occasion to hear him do this but Ashley has a brain filled with poetry and mm. if you're talking about a particular subject he will suddenly begin to quote a lengthy poem i i um, he's just amazing he's an amazing man